uh, you know, resent this fact that of the pandemic, you know, preventing us all from traveling. I have to say, we have also appreciated how we can be connected, um, you know, well, via the famous now Zoom or anyhow, some, some kind of uh, webinar software. Um, and, it, and sometimes it doesn't cease to amaze me. And uh, I think as we go, as I hope we, we go out of the pandemic uh, soon, we, we should keep some of the things that we have learned in this period. And saying this, I hope to see you all in Luxembourg in person <laughs> and not via Zoom, um, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, and then, yeah, and, and uh, well, congratulations for having such a big and active uh, standing group. That's uh, that's fantastic, I think. Um, and I think this is this is one of the things that the CPR um, offers, um, truly. Um, and and actually, I have to say, probably CPR was my first real conference when I was a PhD student. I don't want to say when because many of you were probably in preschool then or <laughs> were not born. So, but anyhow, I th anyhow, I think it was in Essex in yeah uh wait 92 93 so anyhow and um have been kind of on and off uh, uh, on his, in on cpr ever since although um yeah cpr has a bit more of a political science uh, perspective and and my research is a bit more sociological but of course the commonalities are many um yeah today uh, in yeah consulting with the uh, with the four colleagues that coordinate the group, uh, uh, we felt that um, this paper that I'm actually currently uh, writing and revising on temporary migration as a category of analysis or category of practice could be of, a, of general interest. And I would be very much looking forward to your comments and questions also in helping me, um, you know, clarify my, uh, my thoughts fully. I'll start sharing my screen. Yes, here we are. Yes, here it is. So, so this is, um, well, I, I think it is not very difficult to understand where this question comes from because temporary migration has been, um, you know, increasingly um, an aspect of migration. And actually what I'm really asking, I think in this paper, does it, is it, does it make sense to, to speak of temporary migration? And if it does, in what ways can we become a bit more uh, specific and a bit more ontologically and epistemologically accurate in speaking about temporary migration because in a way temporary i mean every migration is temporary or at least that is what the migrant thinks that is the myth of migration you're going and probably you will return and certainly that is the case for migrations uh you know within europe or more broadly even though you know living now in canada and maybe from a canadian perspective we in the past had uh, more um, this idea that, so that people who, who were going to Australia or to North America were taking this as more of a lifetime decision. But the, what we're witnessing today, in, including in places like Canada, that is by, if you want by excellence, a, a destination country, and, and, and I'll say a couple of words about this in a minute, so is that temporary migration becomes uh, increasingly common uh, both in terms of the various schemes that regulate temporary migration, for instance, towards Canada, but also in terms of people's journeys and people's intentions. And that is the, the, the second starting point for this reflection and this paper is that our migration trajectories, both of highly skilled, but also of lower skilled people are increasingly fragmenting, uh, fragmented and non-linear. So migration um, is no longer understood as from origin to destination, but the destinations can be multiple and it can, they can be in a chain order. So like I go from country A to B and from B to C, but they can also be uh, like I go from A to B, go back, and then for different reasons, I leave again and go to another country. And uh, certainly um, there's something to be said there about the mixed motivations of temporary migration. Um, or that is again a general observation that uh, the motivations of migration, while predominantly economic, they can also have important, for instance, political components, components of protection and humanitarian, um, you know, flows, and not just um, you know the motivation of a better job and a better income. And it is increasingly difficult to distinguish, I think, between the two. And I think we're all witnessing this also in our in our own research, in that. Um, we, uh, we speak more and more um, 
actually those of us who work on migration increasingly work also on asylum and asylum is no longer something for international lawyers and human rights experts. Um, speaking about the, the preference for temporary and circular migration, um, I think of course when I, when I speak there about the preference, I mean more the preference of destination countries or perhaps to a certain extent also countries of origin to the extent that they can see in temporary and circular migration an element of brain circulation and not brain drain, but rather, um, uh, you know, the, the possibility of remittances, uh, both economic and social, coming back to the country of origin and of avoiding, you know, educating people or training people and then having them leave. Um, having said that, I, I just want to make a footnote about um, Canada because I think it, it is um, a case that can prompt um, or has prompted me and I think can prompt many of you to to rethink your 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 views and I don't know I mean I, I thought I was familiar with Canadian immigration policy when I came here but only I discovered that my familiarity was very limited and I had not very much realized that Canada brings a lot of people directly as permanent residents so it's not just that um, the country has a proactive immigration policy that it invites people that it has a point system um, and all of and, and a lot and a lot of other things, but it's also the the idea and the practice that people normally here come as permanent residents. And I want to make a footnote in this and say that I'm not yet a permanent resident. So I went to Canada with a work permit, and I'm now uh, with my family applying for a permanent residency. And actually, it was interesting. Like a colleague told me, you know, speaking about practical issues, you know, and tax declarations and all this, and. He said, you know, Canada doesn't care about you as long as you're, you know, a temporary work permit holder. They only care about you in both good and bad ways once you're a permanent resident. So you only exist in, in you know, in the landscape. And at the time, I thought that, that was last year. At the time, I thought that was a very exaggerated statement. But then I realized that it, it is true that generally in Canada, the norm is you become, you come as a permanent resident. However, having said this, looking at data, and the other day at the webinar we had in my, in my uh, program here, uh, looking at the data, so Canada brings in every year 350,000 people and these target, uh, targets of annual net immigration have risen to 410,000 for this year and slightly rising in, in the three year plan. And Canada has 36 or 37 million people. So it's about 1% of the population each year. So you can see, you know, and it is a proactive immigration policy. At the same time, uh, Canada in 2019 brought under different schemes. So it brought about, well, it brought, it had um, 400,000 international students. And here international students are classified as temporary migrants technically and about another 500,000 people under different schemes that range from seasonal farm workers to live, live in and live out caregivers to people like me, to people in the trades category. So um, all sorts of, of things. And I think this is something about um, the tension that can exist between our economic prerogatives in terms of labor markets and just in time migrant labor and our political prerogatives that in a country, for instance, like Canada, more than in European countries, there is um, a wish for long term migration. So I think that in a way makes all the more, um, I think, necessary to discuss what is exactly temporary migration and how does the reality of migration on the ground uh, coincide or deviate from uh, actually what is envisioned in policy. And I think there too, we need to, to understand migration in, in its very specific socioeconomic context of the 21st century. Uh, so in a, in a context of uh, non, not no longer, or if you wanna say a post-industrial economies and where migration, migrant labor is very much absorbed in sectors that are not, that are very, how can I say volatile, where they are characterized by small employers. It's no longer the post-World War II migrations of go people going to work in big factories and in big companies and in mines and in, you know, in, in, in the industry. But now we see a lot of polarization actually in the labor markets 
where temporary migrants are found at the highest and the lowest ends of the scale. So on one hand, we find temporary migrants as professionals, researchers, highly skilled managers, engineers, medical doctors, paramedical personnel, um, in, 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 you know, in the, the kind of migrants that in Europe and elsewhere are presented as the migrants we want, you know, the, the famous desired migration of uh, Sarkozy of 10 years ago. And however, temporary migrants are also predominantly found in the lower end of the labor market, uh, more into, you know, making sense of it more in through dual labor market theory. So in those areas that the locals do not want, those um, dirty, dangerous and demanding jobs like in agriculture. Um, and what, uh, what we have, I mean, we researchers, and I'm sure many of you in your work have discussed is this permanent temporariness. So, and the permanent temporariness for highly skilled migrants is defined as, you know, the expat community, or may I say some as, as people like us that can, you know, move from one country to another following um, an academic career path or people in the business sector following, um, again, their own careers. But this permanent temporariness in that case is a bit, uh, in our case is kind of more voluntary and flexible while we find a lot of permanent temporariness in the lower end of the scale, you know, among, uh, for instance, seasonal farm workers that have hit the headlines during the last months um, under the pandemic where people do not choose but are obliged to, to, to this permanent temporariness because this is the way these sectors are regulated and because they do not have the socioeconomic and the migration conditions to bring their families and kind of settle at destination um, while they would probably want to. And we have seen also particularly in agriculture, the discussion um, in, in Europe being one of, um, I think more than, than thinking about the, the rights or, or the, the long-term perspectives in migration that should be given to, for instance, temporary workers in agriculture, uh, the discussion has been more, oh, we need to renovate um, agriculture and do more automation. Um, and, and at the same time, of course, we've witnessed the, you know, the, uh, the tensions of this discussion of these migrants being actually um, essential, uh, essential components of our economies and our societies. Now, going to, to my analytical um, reflection, um, so what I'm, uh, what, I've, what I'm trying to do in, in, in this paper that I'm writing is, is thinking um, of temporariness in, the, uh, in terms of a category of analysis for us researchers and asking when is it, um, sorry, when, it, when is it, um, uh, you know, how is it defined by governments in terms of uh, forced temporariness, for instance, for refugees, regulated temporariness, that is the one that we know best and have discussed most, and flexible temporariness, which is basically what is happening in the EU, but also in other world regions like Mercosur in Latin America, where people can circulate freely among the countries that are members of Mercosur. So I thought that, that was an element, while we've discussed this permanent temporariness de facto, we haven't looked enough at how this is defined in terms of the policies, if we want to analyze the policies. And I'm talking about forced temporariness, not in the sense of seasonal workers having to go back to their countries when their permits expire or not being allowed to stay more than six or nine months at destination, but more in terms of refugees, because refugees are in theory by excellence, <coughs> a temporary group because they ask for protection for that time while they cannot be in their country and they cannot be in their country either because they're persecuted or because there's conflict and instability and uh, um, you know, conditions that do not provide for security. So in theory, refugees are temporary. Um, and we all know, for instance, um, that oftentimes refugees end up in Spain, but we see this temporariness also particularly in Europe in the category of subsidiary or uh, protection for people like, for instance, Syrians who are not fleeing individual persecution, but they are fleeing conflict and instability in their country. And we see now that um, 
places like Turkey in particular are trying to force Syrians to go back because Syria is now more stable and in theory more peaceful. So that is one type I think of forced temporariness that we need to, to think about in terms of our analysis. Now, second, as I said, is the most, um, the best known uh, uh, type of temporariness, which is seasonal migration in agriculture, in tourism, in catering, in construction. And we've seen in many, in, um, you know, in many, how can I say, different facets um, in Europe. And um, we have seen it particularly, I mean, for instance, my own work has also highlighted how such temporariness can be regulated, but it can also be spontaneous and partly informal um, because people may use, for instance, a permit that exists for agriculture, but then um, engage in employment in construction or for instance, move from one region to another and um, while initially they were working agriculture, then work for tourism uh, in a seasonal uh, way. And we know that there is um, a directive, an EU directive that regulates uh, these issues in the EU, but that, that the interpretations of the directive can be uh, quite flexible and, and um, you know, subject to the particular uh, regional economic realities, not even national, but regional economic re realities in those areas where agriculture or tourism are, um, is, is strong. Uh, and last, the flexible temporariness is in trade and migration, as you understand it, because people can move back and forth. And we've seen this very much in the study, for instance, of in trade and migration after the economic crisis of 2009 and during the acute phases of the Eurozone. Um, economic crisis where we've seen, for instance, uh, people from Southern Europe and Ireland moving to other European countries, but we've also seen, for instance, Romanian migrants that were in Italy, uh, that were in Spain, uh, moving, for instance, to Italy that was less affected by the crisis or trying to move, say, to France or, or, or Germany to seek work because obviously they had the right to do so. And I think this is perhaps um, from a policy perspective not even conceived as temporary migration because this is what we would call an, an enhanced regional mobility regime. Uh, but not in all cases is it supported by a citizenship uh, set of rights, uh, like in the EU, like in Mercosur, it doesn't come with a citizenship. But however, what is emphasized is because the Mercosur countries share important um, historical, cultural and political ties they should facilitate, um, uh, you know, temporary movement within the region. And we've seen um, that this system has worked with its problems, has worked during the Venezuelan crisis that has been going on uh, now for over five years. Um, getting to my next, uh, so, so my, the next part of my reflection is, however, how does this relate to the uh, temporary migration on the ground and how do migrants perceive their migration? Because we know oftentimes that migrants um, take up a temporary migration, um, you know, scheme and, and opportunity, but not because they plan to be temporary, but simply because this is the only option uh, available for them. So I think we would benefit from an understanding to, of, of the extent to which te a temporary stay was intentional or planned or it was befallen on them or if you want imposed on them. Uh, so an intentional or planned uh, temporariness can be again in the higher end that of intra-company transferees, but it can also be that of domestic and care workers. Um, that may do this either, um, sometimes also voluntarily. One, one area that where we have seen that, and in uh, my work, for instance, with uh, Sabrina Marchetti on circularity of Ukrainian domestic workers between, for instance, Italy and the Ukraine, where this circularity was intentional because uh, the workers involved had important uh, care obligations also in the country of origin and also um, found that this was a more livable, livable solution for them because staying um, kind of long-term in Italy in a, often in a living care job was too heavy uh, emotionally. So we can see that there, are, there can be different reasons why people may intend uh, or plan their stay to be temporary. Um, 
and at the same time, we know, so, so I think this is important. We shouldn't think that migrants always want to be long-term because there are important reasons why they need to be um, staying for a period of time and perhaps circulate between two countries. Then of course, there is the other area um, of what I call befallen temporariness. So the temporariness that is imposed on you because of your visa or because of your, um, the type of employment that you're getting and your migration status. And uh, again, a third category there that reflects the flexible um, temporary schemes that I discussed just earlier is what I call from an intentional perspective of the migrant open-ended. And you may, are, um, you may ask, why is this not intentional or planned and you call it open-ended? It's because I think particularly in tri-EU migrants, knowing that they have the possibility to circulate may have a different take in on their migration plan. So they may be really kind of, and, and again, we've seen this in some studies documenting um, uh, what is called on onwards or return intra-EU migration, where for instance, uh, Romanians settled in Spain might have tried either to move to another country or to go back to Romania, but leaving temporarily the family in Spain seeing what is the situation in Romania and whether they can go back or eventually deciding to move uh, the whole family to Italy. So this is the kind of open-ended temporariness and I would say probably is the more, um, how can I say, uh, quintessential of our time where transport and communication has us so interconnected that people can really make their plans in a very active way and, and have more agency and more control over their, their migration project. At the same time, of course, we know that this is probably available only to people with specific migration status. Intra-EU migrants are one status that has this kind of uh, flexibility for open-ended temporariness. I have, um, um, I have tentative, tentatively put in their international students um, because international students are again one of those categories of temporary migrants that are um, desired by destination countries because they bring young highly skilled people who bring their money to, to the destination country and if they were to stay many countries have various schemes that help this transition from the temporary status of the student to the long-term status of the student and I think many times international students have not decided during their studies whether they want to stay or go back or probably they go they think they want to go back but they eventually stay so that uh, brings me to um, the, my final uh, two points in this paper is about to discussing um, the role of migrant agency and the role of intermediaries in this um, kind of analytical framework of migration uh, temporary migration as a category of analysis and as a category of practice so if we want to look at, um, at the analytical, um, you know, at, at the analytical level, we want to look at what is the role of migrant agency in temporary migration. I think um, the role is very important and it's kind of ongoing to the extent that we see um, temporariness as, as, as a category of practice. So we need to pay attention to the kind of resources that migrants, different types of migrants can mobilize, and this can be human capital, obviously, obviously, credentials and skills. And, but, and with skills, I want to emphasize that these are not just degrees from colleges and universities, but can also be concrete work skills, as we have seen with the case of farm workers. Um, of course, social capital is very important in temporary migration and in navigating whether the policy hurdles or the opportunities of uh, the labor market and these include friends, relatives, diaspora organizations, but also employment or travel agencies and employers themselves. And of course, the material capital. So when people um, travel as international students under a study visa or as economically independent persons, um, these are very important resources uh, in navigating a temporary uh, migration context. Now, on the other hand, it is important also to note that temporary migration give rise to a whole industry that takes more um, 
that, they, that has a higher importance in the context of temporary migration rather than in the context of a one-time migration. I leave um, Italy and I come settle in Canada and that's it. So I need these intermediaries only once. But if I'm a temporary migrant, for instance, employment and travel agencies are very important. Um, and we have seen very interesting studies in this sector on, in the care industry in Europe, but we have seen this also in, you know, studies, studies in other world regions, like for instance, uh, South Asian migrations to the United Arab Emirates and the role of employment agencies in managing these temporary and circular migrations for, for construction or, or uh, care work uh, in, uh, in the Middle East, in the Emirates in particular. Um, and travel agencies there play a role because oftentimes they're really, um, you know, important brokers of, of this situation and they can help people prepare their arrival or their return. Uh, Non-governmental organizations, I think, in, in, in this context can be very important because temporary migrants compared to more kind of long-term migrants may not know their rights, may not know the language, may not have uh, developed networks at the destination. And of course, lawyers, um, I think, are part of this because um, whether they are pro bono lawyers linked to non-governmental organizations to help migrants or, you know, professional lawyers, um, and I can tell you there, um, again, here in, in, in Canada, like in the US and in Australia, immigration law is a big professional sector. It's a really big professional sector. It's a whole industry of lawyers and legal uh, assistants um, that work uh, you know, with, with migrants to help them navigate through the different statuses, particularly if one is a temporary migrant or an international student and want to, to make their stay uh, long-term. Educational institutions, I think, have been also, you know, under the SADO in, discussion, in discussing temporary migration that far. And while I am myself, and this is something perhaps for our discussion, I'm myself a bit um, hesitant to put international students under the guise of temporary migration, like they are classified here in Canada. I think there is a point to be, you know, there, there is a, a, an, an important point of reflection there because educational institutions have become in many countries and we'll see it now in the UK, not just with what was before international students, but now also with EU students, they, they become important brokers of such temporary migration and they become uh, import, important parts of this industry along, for instance, um, you know, as I said, lawyers, migrant associations, and of course, international organizations that also play a role um, in, in uh, you know, supporting and regulating uh, these, uh, these different types of temporary migration. Um, so eventually, yeah, and to conclude my, my last, uh, in a way, question for you and that I would be happy to, to, to hear your, your views and answer your questions is, can we really speak of a single typology of temporary migrants or is this variation? Um, making the category of temporary migration too broad to, to matter, too broad to be useful. Um, does, do you find this, this framework that I proposed of the category of analysis and category of practice as useful to create a taxonomy? And as, as you saw, I, I have tried to look more on one hand on policy and regulation uh, in terms of analysis and practice in terms of the agency of migrants and their intentions and try to see how the two interact. Uh, but uh, I have not touched upon the question of time because we know there's different definition. The classical definition of temporary migration is anything under 12 months. But then how do we measure time when these are repeated periods of say six or eight months within a calendar year? Um, and of course, the macro, meso and, and micro dimensions that I try to figure out in terms of the different actors and how um, they, they, they make part of this, um, of this reflection. So I, I would like to conclude here and, you know, invite your comments and questions and I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you.